and this is their daughter. I don't. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Vijay Skeen, the executive director of the Hartford Area Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome you folks this morning. And thank you to our representatives, except the Hartford representative who got lost en route, but uh, they do send their apologies. Um, delighted to see such a good crowd here this morning, and uh, hopefully it's an informative event. This is uh, Beth from the Woodstock Chamber, and she's going to introduce our Moderator. Moderator. Hi there, I'm Beth Finlayson, I'm the Executive Director of the Woodstock Area Chamber, and um, we're glad to be able to co-host this event with PJ. It's wonderful to see so many people here on a bleh Monday morning, and we really appreciate everyone, all of our senators and representatives that have uh, joined us. And I'd like to introduce Bob Hager, um, who many of you may know, who is going to be our moderator, and, and I've watched him in in um, action when we hosted a governor's debate several years ago and um, so he's going to keep us all in check and um, Bob was raised in Woodstock and graduated from Woodstock Union High School and Dartmouth College and he married a Vermonter his wife Honey who went off to work um, as a TV news reporter for 45 years 35 of those years were at NBC Network working out of bureaus in Vietnam, Berlin, Moscow, in the for former Soviet Union, New York, and finally in Washington, D.C. He always knew he and his wife would return to Vermont upon retirement, and that's just what they did, and they've lived the last 14 years as full-time residents of Woodstock. So welcome, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Pat. PJ, thanks. Thanks everybody for uh, coming this morning and for the invitation to uh, run things here. The most important thing, Beth said, be sure and bring your bell, because <laughs> the governor's debate that she was talking about, we, we use the bell to keep people on time. Beth, Beth would like to uh, wrap this up at 9.30, uh, so I, I'm going to, I'll be gentle with it, but I am going to use it. Anyway, thanks uh, to our merchants and all our commercial people for uh, what you do for our communities, making them what they are, and to our lawmakers for your public service and being our voice in Montpelier. So uh, thanks for coming too. Uh, as Beth said, I did always know that I was going to come back here because uh, I love it and my wife loves it. Uh, but the, the Vermont that we grew up with uh, coming of age in the 1950s was different. I mean, there's been a lot of change. Uh, the Vermont I grew up with, for one thing, talking about politics, I mean, it was uh, very Republican. So that, that's one thing that's certainly changed. Uh, the job picture has, uh, in, the, in those days, uh, after the machine shops, which uh, really were humming and, and we had an awful lot of people commuted from Woodstock and I'm sure from Hart Hartford and all this area uh, to the shops in Springfield or, or Claremont and Windsor. Uh, so the, as they went down, uh, the other thing was agriculture. The state was very, in the 1950s, very agricultural uh, and uh, as a result, somewhat poor. Uh, so so thing, it was tough to make a living outside of the machine shops. Uh, so anyway, things, things have changed a lot. Uh, but the one thing that's remained constant is it's a wonderful, friendly, warm place to live. Oh, I, I know one thing about uh, people outside Vermont never knew where it was. I mean, uh, an awful lot of them. When I took my first job after uh, college uh, down south, I went down to broadcast baseball in North Carolina, and people used to say, uh, you're from Vermont? Now, let's see, where, where's Vermont? Is that, is that Canada? Or what state is Vermont in? So anyway, that's all changed. Uh, we're uh, nationally known, partly... Uh, Everybody after Bernie knows us, certainly, uh, but uh, and in any event, no, known as a wonderful tourist destination, nice place to live, nice place to raise a family. So that is, uh, you all are part of keeping our community vibrant. So thanks again for coming. Uh, now what we're going to do is, is have each person uh, talk for about five minutes, and I will ring my bell when, when, when you're four minutes in, so you'll know uh, we're four minutes in, and then... At uh, five minutes, I'll, I'll ring it. Just so we, uh, uh, Beth and PJ said it's important to get people to work and get people out at 
at 9.30. Uh, so, so I'm not being draconian with the bell, just trying to be gentle. <laughs> so, um, just in, in terms of uh, uh, giving us your impressions of what's going on in uh, Montpelier and how it affects uh, the rest of our lives, uh, let's go by seniority here, which means we'll do uh, Senator Clarkson first. Uh, so, Allison Clarkson, Democrat from Woodstock, represents all of w Windsor County. Uh, she went to Harvard, uh, as a, was a theater producer in New York, then six terms in the Vermont House, now in her second term in the uh, Senate, so she's in her 15th year. Uh, she's vice chairman of the Committee on Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs, also the Committee on Government Operations, uh, the uh, Panel on Sexual Harassment, Liquor and Lottery Task Force, and the State Workforce Development Board and Regional Economic Development Grant Advisory Committee. Uh, so, Senator Clarkson, if you'll start us off. Okay. Macy, how do I turn this on? Ah. Good morning. Uh, it works. It works. Good morning. First, uh, I'm Allison Clarkson, and I'm thrilled to represent you in, in the State House. Um, I just would like to say that Alice Nitka and Dick McCormick, who take equal pleasure in representing the Windsor County District, are we are dividing and conquering this morning. They are in Ludlow at a similar breakfast in Ludlow. So they are not able to join us, and I'm entrusted with carrying our water. Although, as you know, we all uh, uh, are on different committees, and we all have different interests and passions, and we all vote differently. So it, uh, it, it's, uh, but anyway, we're a good team. Uh, I, we, I think we're asked to address the things that we think are, are most pressing or are of greatest concern to us at the moment. And actually, I think there are so many subjects. I think one of the things that makes this so stimulating and why I am still in the State House after 15 years <coughs> is that each court, each bill is like taking a, having a graduate course in that subject. And so for those of us who love, have a lifelong love of learning, it's a very stimulating place to work. Um, I would say that the two overarching issues that we address in the budget and in uh, all aspects of the work that we do at the State House are mitigating the effects of poverty and mitigating the effects of climate change. Uh, these are two overarching issues that we, uh, we deal with poverty uh, in education, in corrections, in mental health, in opioid prevention, in suicide. We have. Uh, uh, we, it, it has a huge impact on our state budget. If we were actually effectively addressing poverty in this state, we would be reducing your taxpayer challenge and we would have a healthier, happier state. And uh, to that end, things like the minimum wage, a bill that has come out of uh, our committee, Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs, uh, increasing the minimum wage, paid family leave, all these issues go to addressing and trying to ameliorate the effects of poverty in our state. Um, and the other one mitigating uh, climate change, I would say is a major economic development issue and one that should be uh, a major concern of yours as it affects five of our most iconic businesses in, in Vermont. And in 50 years, Vermont will not look or produce the, have the same economy if we continue on the path that we are on. And to that end, I've introduced a number of, uh, of, of climate change related bills in, in the Senate. Um, five of our most iconic businesses that we all treasure and market all the time in this state. Skiing, agriculture, forest products industries, tourism, um, any number of things could be the fifth, whether it's, it's uh, snowmobiling or anything that, that uh, that is of uh, that re relies on the environment that we have at the moment. Um, all of these industries are under threat, and all of these uh, cannot afford any further warming. And uh, it, it, for me, as a result, it becomes a really a, an economic imperative for us to address this. In, in addition to the fact that uh, we will uh, we will not have the the Vermont that we know and love if we uh, continue uh, on this path unchecked. So. For me, those are many of the overarching issues that we that that affect those two big issues and the things we deal with. That being said, there are specific things. It's a constitutional amendment year. I serve on the committee that is dealing with constitutional amendments. We passed our first constitutional amendment 
on Thursday in the Senate. Um, and we, if it goes to the House for ratification, they can't change it. Um, and it is for uh, re uh, personal reproductive uh, liberty. And it is uh, basically enshrines current practice in our Constitution of uh, a woman's right to choose and a family's right to choose their own life course. And that uh, is exciting. We have six <coughs> proposals of amendment to the Constitution. They can be entertained and discussed. Oh, More to follow. You've got a minute. You've got a minute. Oh, okay. that means I have one minute. Yeah. So the, the process, um, there are many issues that we're going to talk about, workforce development and lots of others, but the constitutional amendment one really resides in the Senate because the House just gets to ratify the work that we have done in our committees. So in my committee, we're looking at uh, uh, perhaps clarifying and simplifying language around the Article One, the amendment were, I mean, the first article in the Constitution that we're so proud of, which prohibited slavery. But there's a second clause which needs clarifying and simplifying, we feel. Um, and so anyway, the process is that it begins in the Senate. It's proposed in the Senate. The Senate committees deal with it. Uh, it comes to the floor. You only vote once on it. There is not usually with a bill you have two and three readings, uh, a, a second and a third vote. In With a constitutional amendment, you vote once. It goes to the House. They get to discuss it and debate it, but they can't change it, and they vote up or down. And so you will see six constitutional amendments addressed this year. Wow. Holy cow. <laughs> I did the job. Thank you very much. Hey, Bob, so you've been training me for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one, one thing is uh, to allow plenty of time for questions at yeah, the end. This is great. Some people have complained in past years, Beth said, about not, not enough time for questions. So I want to allow that. Thanks very much for that. So sticking with seniority, we come next to uh, John Bartholomew. Um, he is in his fifth term now, so in his ninth year, representing Heartland, Windsor, and West Windsor. He was born in Philadelphia, graduated from the University of Oklahoma, and, and uh, graduate degrees from Oklahoma State. He's uh, by profession a veterinarian uh, and uh, worked at NIH for a long time where he managed research animals and then moved to Heartland in 2005 and shortly after uh, began his legislative career. He's on the Committee on Agriculture and Forestry and the House Rules Committee. So, John. How did you know so much about me? <laughs> thank, thank you for having us all here. I'll just pick up where um, Senator Clarkson left off with the constitutional amendments that we are looking forward to um, um, taking a look at. I think probably all of you know, but I should just make sure that you know, is after we pass them, assuming we pass them this year, they have to come back again in the next biennium, the next legislature, so basically two years from now, and that legislature, both the House and the Senate, have to pass the exact same language, and after that, it goes to the voters. So changing the Constitution is not easy to do, and I think that's basically a good thing. Um, and then, of course, in the House, the Constitution says the House, the, the money bills begin in the House, so we have just passed the tax bills and the budget, which is a big deal, and it's going over to the Senate. So, um, and that was actually, the, what was, I think, really notable about that is it had extremely wide support. I, how many of you no votes there were? Just one. Maybe, maybe one no vote in the House on the budget, and the committee vote was, I think, 11, or 11 on the committee, 11 zero. So, that was, um, what, what I'm, I guess I'm trying to say here is we tr really try in, in our legislature to make sure all sides are heard and that um, we don't always agree, but we do our best. Um, and I am on House Agriculture and Forestry, and we're working on a lot of stuff. We're trying to focus on some rural economic development stuff. One bill we passed, and I reported it on the floor, dealt with the... Um, uh, regulation of neonicotinoid pesticides and I think maybe I think I hopefully everyone realizes that we're really having a, a problem probably a crisis facing our pollinators and pollinators are critically important to our foods um, it's been estimated that one out of three bites that we eat comes from the work of pollinators at least there are something like 85 crops across the world that are very plant fruits, vegetables, grains that are uh, pollinators are required or they're beneficial to the production of those. So losing these pollinators, both our honeybees and our native pollinators, is a really big problem. 
So what this act, what this bill does, is it makes neonicotinoid pesticides a regulated um, pesticide, which means that it can they can only be used by certified applicators. But another big piece of that bill is educating beekeepers and uh, registering beekeepers so that we across the state we know where the hives are. And one of the issues that happens here is uh, varroa mites, which uh, transmit various diseases, and they're very debilitating to the honeybees. They also then spread the viruses and other diseases to our native pollinators. So we're trying to make sure that we have uh, varroa mite mitigation plans in place for our, for our beekeepers and um, that we are trying to control the spread of infectious diseases. So it's a, it's an important bill. We've also in my committee talked a lot about hemp. There's not any specific bill about hemp, but I, are people familiar with the, the, all the different products that you get from hemp. I mean, it's it's an incredible plan. And it's been, uh, finally, the federal government has recognized that hemp is not the same thing as marijuana. Although it's the same genus and species, it's a very different cultivar and has essentially no <coughs> psychotropic effects. And the, the products you can get from hemp include um, fiber for clothing and paper and even building materials. <coughs> The seed is a nutritious seed, as well as um, the oils you can get from there are, it's an edible oil, plus it could be a fuel. And one of the big things you probably heard about is the CBD oil from hemp. And um, that's probably where most of the focus in Vermont is. But trying to find the right ways to find, to, to create production facilities, uh, the farmers, oh, that's not one, that's yeah, not one. I'm only getting we, we do so much that it's hard to figure out what to focus on. Um, so anyway, uh, trying to, f to uh, create facilities for drying and extraction and testing for CBD oil. Beyond that, um, we did pass in the House uh, a bill that protects a woman's right to choose. That would codify what's been in Vermont law for basically, well, it's actually not in Vermont law, it's been Vermont practice for 40 years. We're putting into law so that the woman's right to choose is protected until, if and when, we are able to pass the constitutional amendment and many other things. But the bell's about to go off, so I'll stop. Thank you, John. Uh, so now we come to uh, Charlie Kimball, Representative Charlie Kimball, Democrat from Woodstock, uh, in his second term, so his third year in the legislature now, uh, representing Woodstock, Reading, and Plymouth. Uh, he went to Woodstock High uh, and UVM, uh, had a 30-year career, has in business and retail, all kinds of industries and banking, software development, and uh, sales and marketing consultant. And he's a co-owner of Elevation Clothing in uh, Woodstock, a ranking member of the House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development, and also on the Legislative Council Committee. So, Charlie. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here and uh, talk to you this morning. <laughs> So I just wanted, uh, my main focus in the legislature is to really focus on economic development, and I'm glad to be on the Co Committee of Commerce and Economic Development, and uh, I'd like to frame the discussion for, uh, I want to focus on the laws or policies that we should either enact, modify, or eliminate to grow and sustain the economy in Vermont. So let's put those in perspective. Uh, let's think about eliminate. Um, so I went to the Vermont Chamber of Commerce about two years ago and asked, all right, so what are the things that you really need to get rid of in terms of regulation uh, to make it easier to do business in the state of Vermont? And so they went out and did an informal member of their surveys and about two, weeks, two or three weeks later came back and said, just don't make it any worse. <laughs> so, uh, but it's always interesting to look at that as to what policies and procedures uh, are on the books that either need to be changed or eliminated. Second, to modifying, uh, looking at Act 250 reform often gets a lot of attention from the business community or development as to say, we need to modify this to make it easier to do business either in terms of our land development. Uh, uh, I know s situations in which the Woodstock Area Mountain Bike Association tried to put in uh, its mountain bike network or network of mountain bike trails on and had an agreement with the landowner to do so and then they were subject to an Act 250 process which took countless hours of volunteer time and a few thousand dollars. Uh, to enact these trails. 
Um, so I actually did sponsor a bill to uh, modify Act 250 to make some of those things easier, whether it's recreational trails or developments within a designated downtown or neighborhood area. Uh, and that bill, there's that, that amendment or bill that I proposed is actually way down in the committee that's looking at an omnibus bill to modify Act 250 following two years of a study committee. And I doubt there will be anything really of substance coming out of that committee or passed by the legislature this session. Um, so that's one thing. In terms of enacting, and that's where most of the time we spend is, is what could we really initiate now? And that really comes down to money and a few different things. So the greatest economic challenge that we face in the state of Vermont is really finding em employees uh, to fill the current or anticipated openings. Uh, and so how do you address that from a legislative basis? It's either money uh, or actually trying to better align what's going on in the education development system uh, in order to bring workers with the skills uh, that are needed to meet those current positions. So we have a very disjointed uh, workforce <coughs> development system in the state and of which we've tried to really align for years. Um, and for one thing, uh, adult career technical education is one particular issue uh, that is near and dear to us, but it's fairly disjointed and not as well coordinated throughout the state. There's different curriculum uh, in different centers. And we have uh, 17 different career technical education centers in the state. So there's a study committee that has been created in our legislation <clears throat> that would try to see how to better organize that working with the different college systems, Com uh, Community College of Vermont, uh, Vermont Technical College, uh, and the state colleges. So that's one particular area. And what would be the result of that? We don't yet know. Another part of that was putting $350,000 into workforce development for people to do weatherization work. Uh, and that is to actually look at uh, oftentimes the reason why weatherization uh, is at a slower pace is not necessarily because there's not enough money in it, because there's not enough people to do the work for weatherization. Um, and so we looked at working with a different CAP agencies, community action agencies, to look at those folks that are eligible for, uh, that face barriers for employment, or for whatever reason, to train them to do weatherization work throughout the state. Um, so that's one particular piece. and. Broadband, uh, talk about broadband as being an initiative across the state. It's no, no secret that uh, for many, uh, to be part of the 21st economy, you need to have high-speed internet. And high-speed, it depends who you ask, is what that means. Is it 100 up and 100 down? Is it 25 free? Is it four over one? Uh, but we really need to have better penetration of high-speed connectivity throughout the state for people to be able to participate. So the governor recommended and actually uh, it was passed by the House to put $12 million into a pilot program uh, to fund six different projects throughout the state, similar to what EC Fiber has done, and EC Fiber has been successful, um, that would actually bring high-speed internet services to many rural communities. Um, and so that is a great program. It has a lot of different pitfalls uh, that have to be avoided, but uh, it's $12 million in a, in a in a loan program administered by the Vermont Economic Development Authority, and it's there's so much more. I know. <laughs> but thank you. I will uh, yield the uh, the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. So uh, now we'll come to uh, Representative Zach Ralph, uh, who's a member of the uh, Progressive Party from Heartland, uh, although he grew up in Woodstock. He's in his first term uh, representing Heartland, Windsor, and West Windsor, uh, has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, also went to high school and college in France, uh, program director for an environmental nonprofit, uh, previously worked at uh, a number of uh, advocacy groups, environmental grassroots sorts of groups, uh, also was a Park Service Ranger and a commercial fisherman, so he's done a lot of different things. Uh, and he's on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee. So, Zach. Thank you, Bob. And thank you to the Woodstock Chamber and Harper's Chambers for organizing this event. I uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to our business community and uh, people here in, in this area. Just out of curiosity, are there any um, business owners, representatives from Heartland, Windsor, or West Windsor? Show of hands. Cool. 
So we got one. Thank you. Um, so I am on. Uh, I am also on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee with Charlie Kimball. Um, so you'll hear a lot of the same stuff. So I'll try to uh, find something else to talk about. But um, <laughs> so it's great. It's really nice having. Um, uh, the mentorship of somebody that I've grown up with uh, in my own committee. So um, this is, as you can tell from my background, being on uh, on a committee that regulates banks and insurance companies is probably not something I have much experience in having before coming to the house. But as Allison um, said, every every day, every issue is like a, getting another master's degree in something that I had nothing, uh, no idea about before. Uh, so this has been an extremely awesome learning experience for me and, um, and I'm excited to learn about the business community and the struggles we have in the state and um, I oftentimes in conversations before joining the legislature we we would talk about uh, you know what is what is what is the problem with our state well it's too expensive you know it'd be we sort of uh, come down to this very simplistic idea that that it's just too expensive to live in, live in the state um, but being on commerce and economic development it's uh, it is it is that it's also a lot of other things um, it's uh, child care is too expensive um, and so we're working to address child care how do we create a professionalized industry that attracts new workers um, so that we can uh, as a result have more people doing this and hopefully have reduced costs for our families to participate participate in child care and when we bring down the cost of child care it means that we ultimately bring down the cost of living in the state so while we might be paying high taxes when we have good services that we're able to take advantage of um, and, and, and not pay as much as you would in other states means we're saving money in the end. And, and so uh, much of what I'm learning about is our need for investment into our future. So child care is a big part of it. Um, we have a small dwindling workforce. I believe it is no secret that we have a shrinking or a, a changing demographic trend in the state uh, where we have an aging, uh, aging population and not a lot of young people coming to the state. Uh, and that means that we don't have people coming in and filling those entry-level jobs, uh, taking care of our older people. Um, so we need to figure out ways. And by the way, Vermont struggles with this, so does the rest of the country. Um, every place in this country except for major metropolitan areas like Colorado and New York and Seattle are seeing a decrease in younger people in their, moving into their, into their states. So it's a challenge that everybody is trying to, to solve uh, and coming up with unique and innovative solutions of how do we attract young people into the state uh, so they stay. And so many of us uh, heard about the, relo uh, the uh, remote worker program last year. Um, yes. uh, yeah, right? It was, um, it was it, I don't think many people knew what to expect, but I gotta say when I first heard about it, I was a little bit skeptical. But what ended up happening, and I think it was unexpected, was we had a billion clicks. People were excited about this idea, this new idea that we were going to offer people money to come to Vermont. And um, so people got excited about it, and as a result, Vermont got a lot of press. I don't know if we can replicate that type of uh, success again, but it doesn't mean we don't stop trying, right? And so we have, uh, we are, there's a new idea kind of out there and, and it's come out of, uh, out of the House and it's now in the hands of Senate, which is this Relocate 802, it's R-E-L-O-802, um, uh, so uh, funky way of saying it, but essentially we want to facilitate the process for people to move into the state. They have an idea of what they want, uh, they need to make a certain amount of money. They know they're going to have kids, things like that. Um, so uh, our Department of Labor is going to work with that. They're going to funnel these people into this, this job market and, and connect them with communities and industries that need more workers so that we are facilitating the process for people to move into the state. Uh, again, there's a lot of reasons uh, why our economy is doing as it is. We are, we are doing strong. I think there's uh, strong potential for a recession in the very new future, and, and I believe nobody is, is not aware of this, and so we're doing our best to make sure our economy is strong, and that when that does happen, we're in the best position possible uh, to protect our, our individuals and businesses here in the state. So I can talk for a lot longer. I'm sure everybody has questions, but um, with that, I will, uh, I will take my leave. But thank you all again for having me here today. Thank you, Zach. And that brings us to uh, Representative Randall Zott. Uh, he's from Barnard, a Democrat, in his first term representing uh, Barnard, uh, Pomfret, and uh, part of Heartland. Uh, went to the University of uh, Central, uh, Central Florida. Uh, you startled me there when you looked up when I said Heartland, but that's right, right? Hartford. 
Hartford. Hartford. Oh yeah, I, 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 thank you, thank you. Hart, Hartford, Barnard and Hartford. Um, you went to the University of Central Florida, has uh, graduate degrees from San Francisco State and Ohio State. He's been a chef, uh, merchant mariner, teacher, writer, lecturer, library director, and he's on the Committee on General Housing and Military Affairs. So, Representative Zott. So, uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, I, just to round that out for a moment, I, I uh, spent 11 years in college at seven schools in five states and have three degrees. And uh, so I had that sort of eclectic work background. I, I, I steal an old Dennis Miller joke uh, in which he said, after all that education, I didn't know enough about any one thing to get a job and just enough about everything to annoy all my friends. Um, and so in a way, it's perfectly appropriate that I'm on the um, uh, general housing and military affairs because we deal with a real grab bag of issues in there in that committee. Um, we have bills that seem sort of silly on the surface, like switching to permanent daylight savings time. Um, and we also have things, though, that are more serious, like paid family leave bill came through our committee and passed, and uh, minimum wage uh, that came to us from Allison's committee. We're just now taking testimony on that. Uh, one of the things that I, as a sort of freshman legislator, that I would like to share is, uh, at least from my naive first-term perspective, is that our, that our institutions are in good shape. Whatever's happening at the national level, when my experience, at least in these, you know, this, first, this first year of this first term, is that our institutions are doing quite well. Um, sometimes it doesn't seem like that in the press because it doesn't get a lot of coverage when bills come out of committee with unanimous votes and there's people from various parties. There's people from various parties on those committees and they come out unanimous and a lot of bills pass the chambers with unanimous voice votes. They don't even have roll call votes. So there's a lot, I think our battery's dying. I think someone's trying to, <laughs> I'll try again. Oh, there um, we'll see how long this lasts. Um, and so one of the other things I, I've noticed in media coverage is there's also a lot <laughs> All right, now we'll try again. I don't have much to say anyway. Uh, uh, so one of the other things that's really interesting is, you know, of course, there's, there is the, you know, there's the paid family leave bill, which got a lot of press, and it's a great bill, but there's also, um, there's also smaller bills that don't, uh, that, that don't get any coverage that will really dramatically change people's lives. Uh, one of the bills I recently went in and presented in Allison's committee, it passed the House and now, now the Senate's doing their work on it, is a H-132, which is a bill that um, adds uh, survivors of domestic and sexual violence to the list of pr um, protected classes against from discrimination. And it's a really powerful bill that really substantively changed people's lives. One of the things that it does is it empowers people to potentially break a lease if they need to, if they feel like their home is not safe because they've been victimized there or because their, their, their abuser knows where they live and they're able to get out of their lease, they're able to change locks, they're able to add security systems and it could really save someone's life. And it ties into this thing that I was talking about with institutions because one of the things that was really gratifying about this bill was the bill came into our committee, there were some objections from representatives of landlord organizations. <laughs> And the committee took those, those objections very seriously, and we convened meetings outside of the committee process with the stakeholders and had them work collaboratively to find language that the advocates could work with, as well as um, the Landlords Association. And, and, um, and that was really interesting to see, again, as a first-time legislator, to see the way that, that these objections can be worked out in a collaborative fashion that everybody can live with. So at the, in the end, the representatives from the Landlords Association signed off and said, yes, we can, we can live with this language. We, we find that this is a reasonable approach to the problem. The advocates were happy to make the changes to make them comfortable, and now we have strong legislation that you know, came out unanimous out of our committee. It's in Allison's committee, and um, it will likely move, it'll likely move forward. Um, in addition to that, as again, this sort of more off the radar bill, then there is the paid family leave bill, which many of you have heard about. And, and again, there were 
you know, it, so the committee process played itself out. Uh, it came through our committee first. It was in our committee for about a month, taking testimony from business owners, um, uh, domestic violence advocates, uh, anti-poverty advocates, all sorts of people came in, and we worked on it for about a month. And off it went to Ways and Means, and it worked. It was there for another month with all sorts of substantive uh, changes and improvements to the bill. And then it even went to a third committee, went to appropriations, where they, they made some changes and some tweaks to it. And I think the bill came out um, much stronger than it was when it first came out of our committee. And I would say that, and again, various people got various things out of the process. I think the business community got some wins out of the process uh, because originally, as proposed, there was an equal share between employer and employee. And as it came out, uh, employers now have the option of whether to cover a portion of it or not cover any of it for their employees. And that um, has its trade-offs, but I think it certainly will set the business community's mind at ease knowing that they could have that kind of a little bit more control over the process with a benefit that they may not have um, originally been strongly in support of. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. I have a... <laughs> Thanks, Randall. No, I think, yeah, can you keep that one? I think we're in business. Uh, I have one question and then uh, think of questions because we'll open it up and we've got half an hour for questions. Uh, I just wanted to ask Allison since that uh, that um, family leave bill I think is probably important to a lot of business people and now uh, it's in your committee I think, am I right? I'm, I'm sure. Can you explain that and how it's going to work and what the uh, outlook uh, is? And it, it has only just arrived. Actually Randall's the person to explain it and where we've ended up with it because it has changed pretty dramatically and Randall's the expert on it. I We have not uh, even walked through it yet so uh, because it only actually finally came out of a probes couple days ago and uh, you pass it on the floor they pass it on the floor Friday Thursday Thursday, Thursday well, was actually, yeah. yeah Friday was third week so uh, actually I'm not the expert on where it is at the moment ran all right I got to look at my notes here um, well I know it's one key thing is uh, uh, how it comes out of the uh, the Senate committee and then whether or not the governor will veto it and I think that's a matter of just a couple of votes, as I understand it, but go ahead. Um, you tell it. it pa well, it passed the House with 92 votes, and I think there were six supporters who were absent uh, that day. So it's, it's close to uh, veto-proof. But I think some of the work that was done was done in, a, in um, I believe, in a spirit of collaboration with the administration. One of the things that the bill originally was slated to do was to be administered at the state level uh, and one of the changes that was made is that it was going to be um, you we we're going to have a private administrator to, we we're going to take bids and have a private administrator do it which is similar to the governor's plan in fact the you know the inspiration for that was that the governor had solicited bids for his his plan and when the people from ways and means saw that it seemed like it would be economically feasible <coughs> to use a third-party administrator they they went that route so that that would be something I would hope would um, be appealing to the governor. And, and as I said, the change from the shared contribution between employer and employee now being at sort of at the discretion of the employer, I think would be another uh, change that I would hope would make the administration more amenable to, to signing the bill. I don't know if you want more details on the bill or what the nature of the contribution is or any of that, but I can, I can share that if that's part of the question. I'll do a quick little summary. So basically there's 12 weeks for bonding leave uh, and eight weeks for uh, uh, disability, essentially, or an injury, or to take care of someone uh, in an in injured situation. And uh, oh, and another piece that was probably of interest in appealing to the business community would be um, there's specific language in there. And so if you have if you have an employee, for instance, who takes leave and you have to hire someone on a temporary basis, and they end up getting laid off and end up collecting unemployment, there's specific language in the bill that will protect employers. Uh, that won't that won't They'll get paid their unemployment, but the employer will not take the hit on their employee unemployment insurance rating. That's there's specific language in there to make sure that that doesn't happen to help facilitate, make it easier for employers to navigate. You know, people who are leaving their workforce and balancing that without having to be penalized on it. But as I said, there's 12 weeks for bonding, eight weeks for uh, disability. It's a 0.55 percent uh, contribution. What do you mean by bonding? 
Oh, bonding like a birth or adoption of a child, something like that, if, uh, you know, right after childbirth or adoption. There's Can you explain what the 12 weeks actually mean? So you have 12, 12 weeks uh, available to take in a calendar year, but the bill is, the bill is also structured that it's not necessarily um, an all or nothing affair. So you can take a week, or you could take six weeks, you could take four weeks, whatever period of time. And particularly around with the, the eight weeks for disability, it's also, it's also structured so that uh, since illnesses and treatment regimens don't don't um, don't fall in predictable fashions, or they don't always fall you like, hey, I, in a one week fashion. If you have, say, cancer treatments uh, that you you have regular chemotherapy, you can take your time in those chunks. Like, I'm going to need three days this week, three days the next week, three days. You can break it up that way because that's the way illnesses work. Um, so the bill is trying to you know accommodate that. And is it to, is it going back to body? Uh, is that paid twelve weeks? Yes, it's paid, but it, it's a, again, it's, a, it's paid where you're, you're paying into an insurance program, essentially. So it's not, it's, the employer's not covering that. It's all coming out of the, in, the insurance fund, basically, that you pay into weekly. The only, the only administrative headache um, for employers will be adjusting payroll for the deductions, and, but everything else will be managed. You know, that money will just get reallocated in a box on a paycheck, and the rest of that gets administered elsewhere. I'm sorry. Are these a shared expense between employer and employee into the insurance pool? Yeah, that's a really key question. Would that be N no, no, it's it's at the employer's discretion. It's a 0.55 percent of pay that gets deducted. The employer could, if they decide it's in a recruitment tool, they could say we'll cover all of that, or, or they could say we can't afford to cover it, and so it's it falls to the em employee. But um, the, the share is completely at the discretion of the employer. So, other questions from the floor? Yes, go ahead. I have a son who is moving back. You don't want to do the mic. Could, could I you just identify yourselves and what town you're from or what business you're in? Would you pray? I'm Molly Hutchins. I have a son moving back to Vermont. He will be working in New Hampshire. Thank goodness he has a job. Um, I'm interested in the relocating effort that the state is doing and if he can benefit from that at all. <coughs> yeah, no, Charlie, you go for it. <laughs> so, uh, Sam, right? So we're thrilled to have Sam try to move back to the town uh, or to the area. So Vermont is trying to attract people to move back to the state. Uh, so there are a lot of different proposals from the Agency of Commerce and Community <coughs> Development to actually do that. Um, the remote worker program was something that was introduced last year with up to $10,000 in qualified expenses if you brought your job with you. What you're talking about is coming here for a job that's local here. And there's a new proposal in the, in the Senate hasn't made it over to the House yet, that would cover up to $5,000 qualified expenses if somebody moved to the state to take a, an existing job opening. If he's working in New Hampshire, um, that isn't qualified. Uh, so it really doesn't work to that degree, even though he might live in Vermont, which he should, absolutely. Um, as we all know, uh, New Hampshire's is upside down. <laughs> um, but uh, as such, that, that hasn't made it through yet. And just a, just a little t uh, bit on strategy, what, what the Senate proposal then puts over to the House and vice versa, what the House uh, says and puts over to the Senate is far from the finish line uh, because a lot of negotiations go on. Like we might pass a bill and send it over to the Senate and it goes up in the committee wall and never comes off. And that's happened in the past uh, for a year, for two years. Um, and so the, the strategy is to figure out how to get that off the wall and get it considered uh, in the legislative session in which you're in. It could always come up in the next year. But so we have a number of bills that we've passed that have gone over to the Senate that may not see the light of day again and vice versa. So it's always a negotiation act to see uh, what actually happens. So with the relocation program for, for Sam, we want Sam to live in Vermont and work in Vermont. We actually have a veterinarian loan pro loan forgiveness program where we actually have allocated thirty thousand dollars in the budget every year to help repay veterinarian student debt. 
Uh, large animals. Large animals, uh, excuse me, restricted to large animals, that's very true. Uh, of which Sam is a large animal guy, so uh, he should really think about coming to Vermont instead. <laughs> um, but there, does that answer that question? Yes, thank you. Other questions from the floor? Yes. Want to take? I think this will, yeah, that sounds like that'll work. My name is Courtney Lowe. I'm with Woodstock Inn Resort. I live in Woodstock. Um, this is really for Charlie and Zach um, from an economic development standpoint. Um, just curious what else besides stay to stay is out there, ideas that you think are kind of hot that you're thinking about that are direct um, ROI opportunities for the state to drive more revenues in so we can do everything else we need to do. <laughs> so I'll start it off and then hand it to Zach. Um, so it's always a good question. We had the first ever Vermont Tourism Day last week at the State House, in which a lot of people from the tourism industry around the state came. And they're advocating for a particular allocation of funds from the Rooms and Meals Tax to be set aside in a promotional uh, event fund or a promotional fund specifically for tourism, 2% of the Rooms and Meals Tax. And that means that it has to come from some other program. Uh, Maine has created that program and raised an incredible amount of money and put it aside just for marketing, uh, for tourism. Um, it's, it's not going to live, this is not going to pass this season at all. This legislative session and maybe taken up next legislative session, but uh, it's always a question of, okay, if you, if you fund that, then what are you not going to fund? Because uh, part of the Rooms and Meals tax also goes into education, I'm not sure what percentage. Anyway, uh, so that's interesting. So the state of state program, something that is funded at the uh, with the Department of Tourism, and they select different properties uh, throughout the state or work with different communities to figure out how to do that. We've talked in, in Woodstock about trying to stand up a program that would be similar, but not using state funds uh, to try to uh, you know, take advantage of the folks that are coming to vacation uh, and then try to convert those visitors into permanent residents. Um, and now I'm going to give it to Zach. <laughs> Uh, so as I mentioned initially, there's uh, there's no real silver bullet on a lot of these things, and um, I think when we're looking at attracting new people, we're also looking at long-term investments about how do we decrease the overhead cost so this is an attractive place to live. Um, so one of those, uh, this isn't a program necessarily to attract people, but will ultimately have the benefit of attracting new, younger families is finding more affordable housing options for people. So more investments in conservation and housing authorities uh, to make sure that we are building more housing. In, uh, in the Upper Valley, I believe we have a 2.7% uh, unemployment and a 3% housing stock. That means that everybody's fighting for those, uh, those pieces of property that are available. Um, so, and that means that it's more expensive. Windsor's one of the more expensive counties to live in. Um, so uh, I think there's, uh, there are the programs that Charlie's talking about, um, and there's also ways that we can uh, address the cost of living in our area. I think it's also important to point out too that um, our economists at the beginning of this session pointed out that there are a lot of really successful examples that we can borrow from across the country that say that we invested this money and as a direct result we saw that more people came into the state. So a lot of this is experimenting, is, is pilot programs and, and the reality is we don't know if they're going to work. Allison. Uh, yeah, but I would, I would say, you know, working on creating more affordable housing is really important. There is also the issue, and I, did, um, I don't give it right to Allison, but there's also the issue of we, while it's important that we're attracting new people, we also have underemployed sections of our state, and uh, in particular, these are uh, people coming directly out of prison um, and people who are recovering from addiction. And when we're able to put these people back in jobs, not only does it bolster our economy, um, but it also means that we are reducing recidivism rates and relapses as well. Uh, because when we're creating, uh, making people healthy, productive members of our society, the idea is hopefully they don't relapse. Um, so um, there's a lot that we can do, and attracting new people is certainly part of it. But um, I'll ask no, I'm just going to add. So um, in, <clears throat> thank you, Courtney, for that question. In the Senate, um, actually, uh, you know, we've, we've done, we did blockchain legislation, we did uh, personal trust uh, uh, opportunities. We've done a lot of exciting things that have made us first in the country. Um, and so as lawmakers, one of our jobs is to create uh, legal opportunities, reduce barriers, and create opportunities for people to do business. Um, one of the exciting things is to build on our blockchain work. Uh, is to create a sandbox, a play space, which is coming to your committee because you guys do insurance. 
So it's a sandbox in the insurance products business, but where we reduce regulation oversight and allow people to really uh, invent and create ideas and present them to the commissioner of the Department of Financial Regulation. Uh, what kind of insurance project a product would you like to see for somebody hiking in the Himalayas that has a challenge that isn't covered currently in a travel insurance program, for example. And we are inviting uh, people to come and look at Vermont as a, a jurisdiction in which they could propose such a thing uh, without having to necessarily fully develop it, but begin the process and get it down the line until it's ready for the legislature to approve. Um, so we're creating opportunities like that all the time. We are uh, growing our downtown tax credit program. We are supporting uh, exciting new ventures in Springfield, like Matt Dunn's um, Black River Innovation Campus. We are doing a lot of support of the great ideas that are coming from our entrepreneurs around the state. And we have some, and one of the exciting things about serving on our committees, actually on all our committees, is is seeing statewide what's, what's happening. And it's, it's very exciting. So we had a field trip, all of our committees in the Senate are asked to do field trips. We did one up in Bradford uh, and had entrepreneurs in, uh, and, and high tech IT people come from all over the state to present uh, ideas on what we could do. Uh, and uh, it's, it's exciting what's happening out there. More from the floor. Yes. My cup? Okay, thank you. I'm Heidi Chenero. I live in Pomfret. Um, uh, I have a question for whoever can best answer this. Um, child care was discussed by, I know, Zach and, and some other people. Um, my degree is in nutrition and dietetics from UW-Madison, and, you know, it was a great career, but once I started having children, I had three children by the time I was 29 years old. I was so in love with those babies, I wanted to stay home. And, you know, the economy has never been that friendly for a woman to be able to stay home. And so I'm listening to, um, you know, the child care thing and providing more child care for families, but is it ever considered that if a woman wants to stay home with her children, which I think studies, family studies and things show that that's the best for a child? is to be home with their um, with their own parents a tax credit you know because essentially the mother then is playing the role of the child care provider so why not ease the burden on those families where the mother wants to stay home and give her um, give the family a tax credit because you are essentially then saving the taxpayers money you're saving the burden on the state to try to find child care I mean, I just can't really envision this state as being one where, you know, every woman is working. I mean, at least in my experience, um, working with other dietitians and different hospitals, things, we all wanted to be home with our kids. We just couldn't. So I, I just want to see if that's been addressed. So, Heidi. As a, a person, it, it's become sadly a, an economic luxury for women to do that, or, or men. I mean, it's a. I have met many full-time uh, fathers who are who, who are caregivers. Um, it's it's a money a question of money. Um, it's a tax expenditure. So any money we choose not to collect in revenue, we have to figure out what we're not what we're not going to cut. I mean, what we're not going to uh, support in that fashion. I think that would be. Uh, an interesting conversation and one that we've actually had in Ways and Means, but we already do not accept a billion dollars. We have a billion dollars of tax credits or what we call tax expenditures that we don't collect. So if we were going to give a tax credit to a parent who was a full-time parent, um, it would be, it, it would probably be fairly expensive and we would probably have to not give a tax credit to something else. And it, that's just a juggling, a, you know, a, a prioritizing question and I think that uh, it's certainly one that if that bill was proposed it would be considered in some in full capacity in the state house and is one that we should look at but it is not uh, you said something that I just want to remind people it's not the state's job to solely solve the child care challenge it's it's three parties benefit from people working productively in our in our world the families <coughs> the businesses and the state so it's up to uh, all of us to figure out how to how to solve that that challenge, and that may be a piece of uh, how we solve it, which would be interesting. Yeah. 
neglecting the back of the room. Let's go back there. Uh, Mike, maybe? I'll try to speak loudly. Yeah, right. My name is Brandon Godfrey. I'm the town manager at Hartford. Um, I've been on the job for about a month, so I'm still sort of assessing the, the landscape. Um, first, thanks to the chamber for, for hosting this. I think this is a great event, and uh, it's important that we, we get the opportunity to speak to our representatives. And thank you all for, uh, for listening to us. So uh, we appreciate you take the time out of your schedules to do this. Um, I don't have questions. I just have a couple of things that I've been able to assess in my short time as, as issues for uh, the town of Hartford, both from the select board perspective um, and from the staff perspective. Um, so I'll just say these things are important to us. First, um, S-106, the municipal self-governance uh, bill, um, is, is really important to us. Um, I don't know how that's going to work its way through the House side, but um, um, certainly um, it doesn't get us to home rule. We're not trying to get that far on the other end of the spectrum, but I think it does give us a practical approach in a Dillon's rule setting to be able to um, to have some autonomy in local government uh, with regard to uh, revenue policy and, um, and land use regulation policy primarily. Um, so that one's important to us. Um, S113, the plastics bill and, and ban on styrofoam containers is something our select board wanted to do um, and um, sort of said, well, let's wait and see what happens at the state house. Uh, um, and uh, so that there's a statewide approach to this rather than a municipal by municipal um, uh, different set of regulations. So we're hopeful that that makes its way through the House and becomes law. Um, uh, also, there I don't know the bill number, but there's a, a bill that's in pla that's that's making its way through that would lift uh, the cap on municipalities with regard to uh, the amount of solar uh, energy credits we can generate. It's capped at 500 kilowatts, and, um, and we're, we're bumping up against that in Hartford. So we, we have solar panels at our public safety building, our public works facilities, our, um, our, our water and sewer utility plants, um, and we have solar fields. And so we've, we've really, we've hit that 500 kilowatt uh, cap, and we'd like to see that raised. Um, and finally, something that's not, um, that hasn't even manifest in a bill or legislation, but Something that I've seen and, and, and um, heard a lot of frustration from my police chief on um, that has to do with um, uh, really criminal justice policy and funding, I think, of our, um, our state's attorney's uh, offices. Uh, they're, they're really underfunded, and um, what that, how that manifests <coughs> is it's very difficult for our police department to be able to obtain uh, felony warrants. And, um, you know, timing is everything, and a lot of that timing uh, is lost when they're working with a, uh, a one or two staff agency uh, and trying to reach them in the middle of the night when they need a felony warrant. So um, I know that that gets into a whole broader area, but it's something that uh, I've seen in a very short time as being a, an issue we'd like to deal with. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I don't want to come back. Charlie, let me spread it around a little bit. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I haven't heard mentioned is affordable housing and the aging community. We have a serious crisis in this area. I'd like to see uh, the legislature uh, spend more time on that. Uh, this area is in crisis mode. Um, uh, the, the agencies are doing the best they can to support those people that we really need to do. The other thing I'm very concerned about for this immediate area, and it was a delight <laughs> to start the uh, Scotland House as a freestanding business. We had our regulations from Hartford and uh, have some ideas about how to streamline starting a freestanding business in this area. But our biggest gap is transportation, and especially public transportation in this particular area. Other adult daycares have solved the problem in their area of the states. It's a partnership. Some of them uh, own their own transportation systems in part and uh, partner with their districts. But we don't have that here in this Upper Valley area. And I'd like to see that addressed. Um, Jerry, may I take the housing piece and then maybe, uh, maybe we can 
uh, so out of our Senate Economic Development Housing and General Affairs, which will go to Randall's committee who deals with housing, we had two big housing bills. Um, the first, as you may remember, two years ago we passed a $30 million housing bond, which is built, uh, which is it has the $35 million housing bond, which is leveraged. Mm, it's ended up being more like $37 million and is, is in the process of building about 700 new housing units. Um, just to give you a notion of, of one of the, ch I mean, we have a huge challenge on housing. We could do with 5,000 new housing units a year in this state. Um, and to that end, we proposed a $50 million, an additional $50 million bond for this year. And uh, the treasurer, I'm afraid, has shot up <laughs> down that balloon, which is really discouraging. And so we've actually charged her with coming back with, okay, so you don't like bonding, so what do you propose? How are we going to build? A thousand to fifteen hundred new units in the next five years, and and what's your best suggestion? Because uh, it's not enough to uh, say we can't afford it. Uh, it, it. We we disagree on how we could afford that. Um, the cri and that would build anyway. So we're we're hoping that that will move forward uh, in in some capacity for next year, uh, so that we can act on it next year. Uh, Jerry's absolutely right. We have a, a, a huge challenge, not only in new units, but in actually renovating old units. As you know, we have a huge uh, stock of older homes. And one of the pieces in the housing bill that we just passed to the Senate um, is a proposal to give a small incentive to current land uh, 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 landlords or, or owners of, of rental housing properties that are vacant or blighted and that that uh, up to $7,000 grant that they would have to match 200%. It would have to be, uh, a, you know, a good percent of it has to be for weatherization, but it, it will hopefully bring online 125 new uh, rental units uh, in, in the state. And it's sort of an experiment to see how that works. Uh, but we're hoping that that will go through, that's just going through the Senate. Um, the challenge also on housing, because there is so little that's available, is the cost. And it goes back to the minimum wage, because in the Upper Valley, as you know, Windsor County has the second highest cost of housing in the state. And uh, to afford a two-bedroom apartment for a family in this county, you have to be earning $22 an hour. Our minimum wage is ten seventy-eight. dollars so, just to give you a notion of the challenges we're looking at and how we try and address them. Uh, your other question was public transportation, and it is a huge challenge, and I don't know if, if anyone has a thought on that. Well, I, I actually just wanted to say something else about um, housing for a minute, because that, that's part of the purview of my, uh, my committee in the House. And one of the words that I've uh, grown to hate in my time in the state house is the word or the word notwithstanding, um, because there are funds uh, that are dedicated to you know from the property transfer tax that are dedicated to financing affordable housing, and every dollar that we lose that's reallocated from that fund by notwithstanding it um, loses about ten dollars of leveraged funds for affordable housing. So if affordable housing is an issue, I think one of the things to do is to bring as much heat as possible to the legislature about leaving the property transfer tax money um, fully funded. Because basically what happens is that there's, a, there's in statute, there's an amount of money that's supposed to be allocated to VHCB to fund actually some clean water projects and land conservation, but also very significantly affordable housing. And that money keeps getting pilfered year in and year out, but there's budgetary realities that that make it happen, but we could, you know, if pressure's applied, they might think a little, a little bit longer before they kind of start shuffling the money around because housing intersects with so many other issues in the state. Got five minutes left. Uh, let's go back there. Uh, yes, my name is Jonathan Tuttle, and I work at Hartford Community Restorative Justice Center. And one of my many roles is as a transitional housing coordinator. I work with people. I interview them in prison and I take them from prison into subsidized apartments and I house them for about six months to a year um, and lately uh, the past two years have really experienced success by uh, pairing jobs local employers have been great um, so I have five apartments around Hartford community that I work with local landlords uh, to rent and I'm just wondering if there's anything in the economic development side to look at helping programs where 
you know, so I move people into apartments, I help them get a job, I surround them with volunteer support, and we've been moving nine to 12 people a year out into their own housing uh, by providing those things. So I just get excited when I'm sitting before these groups thinking about this, because here I am doing some of this, coordinating on a local level, the housing, the job and support. And I'm wondering where the economic development side of the house comes into that. My grant is through the Department of Corrections, um, and I would love to diversify my funding. But I'd really like to talk to people about how we could better blend the business community with the housing, with the support, uh, because I see that happening on a local uh, level really successfully. And one of the things that I do that I think is of great value is um, I focus on community safety. And the best way to do that is to create stability for folks, to move them beyond the opioids, is to not focus so much on the drug but on what's going wrong in their lives, giving them yeah, something to live for. And so if there was ever an opportunity to speak with you all more about how to, how to do that, um, I have a local uh, business owner here who I try to support the business owners by supporting their employees, meeting with the business owners to make sure employees are showing up on time. Um, so lots of opportunities, I think, to really develop a conversation around how we could, at a grassroots level, uh, better coordinate with the state level to get that funding out there to grow all of these different um, programs that actually already exist. And what I see us doing is acting as a funnel. Um, I actually have three people who have now gone through the Hartford Career Technology Center's adult training program. Uh, the welding program is fantastic. I mean, it provides a certificate to folks. They're very supportive up there. So what I see is this dignity restoration happening through programs that already exist. And where I get frustrated is by trying to find all these and pull them together uh, into our office. So that's my two cents. Thank you all for what you do. Thank you for what you do. And, and this uh, alums of correction is addressed in our workforce development bill. We're very, uh, we're all interested in exactly that. And I think we all love to talk to you uh, after this. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a few different things. One is in the workforce development bill that we passed and has gotten now over to the Senate. One is to create a registry of employers that are willing to hire employees that uh, have barriers to employment, such as having served in, uh, having been incarcerated or having uh, some kind of drug addiction. So that's one thing. Uh, and also vocational rehab, I'm sure you work with them as well. Uh, they provide um, assistance to folks that also face barriers to employment, actually on the job, get them in. Uh, and actually provide them some training and some support services. I'm sure you're involved with that. Uh, we also actually just passed something about uh, creating more training for probation and parole officers because oftentimes uh, probation and parole officers don't understand the rhythm of business. So uh, they might hire an employee and then uh, they'll go to see that employee and actually take them out of the workplace at a critical time and suddenly that person uh, is then no longer employed because they missed a critical uh, uh, shift or whatever. Um, so that's very important also. Um, so those are a few things. Um, and around adult CTE, uh, and we really want to see more credentials of value coming out for folks that are coming out of uh, incarceration. Um, it's very difficult for them while they're serving time to actually get that because of their intermittent schedule. They have to, most of them are not there long enough to actually gain that certificate of value. Uh, so there has to be other programs outside. So. That's part of that study we were talking about earlier, that hopefully there'll uh, be better things there. That's a short answer. I think the witching hour is here. I think we should stop because it's, it's 9.30 now. Uh, one thing. Beth's Beth been trying to ask, ask a question. So oh, Beth, sure. So the if chamber I could, sponsored us, give her, give her a question. <laughs> if I could just ask, um, I, not all affordable housing are our apartments or I mean there are affordable housing that are single family and how do you how does the state see working to keep those out of the hands of second and third homeowners who then buy them to um, rent them on VRBO or other means of um, you know whether it's home away all of those short-term rental. short rentals because short-term rentals I know in the Woodstock area are a concern. Well, we're just, yeah. I don't even know how to turn this on. Okay. Just go on. <coughs> there you go. 
Um, Short-term rental challenge is huge. Uh, as you know, we taxed them last year, I mean, so that they are now, uh, Airbnb in particular is compliant. Um, it is a real challenge, particularly in Woodstock where I live, uh, three of the, uh, I live on the affordable side of town and three of the houses in my neck of the woods uh, have been bought by seasonal people who have turned them into short-term rentals. So it's very discouraging. Um, and I, th I believe that that is being addressed in uh, ordinances in, in Woodstock, is that we're, we're working on that. We have yet to figure out, other than compliance on health and safety and on tax, from a state point of view, we, we are still discussing how, whether it's appropriate for the state to intervene on this, but it's a huge challenge, as we all know, and it's sort of, it's an additional gut to our communities where we're hunger for full-time uh, owners and residents, and we hunger for more kids in our schools. Uh, in my lifetime of being a mother in Woodstock, I have seen the Woodstock Elementary School go from 350 kids when our eldest, who's a deputy state's attorney uh, here in Windsor County, entered kindergarten. There were 350 kids in the Woodstock Elementary School. They're now about 170. Are we including Pomfret or <coughs> no, no? But we're significantly lower, and this only exacerbates the short-term rental challenge. Only exacerbates that. So um, Woodstock's looking at it as an ordinance, and it may be a town-to-town -town thing. At, but we're also looking at it as a state challenge. I do. Uh, it's still a free country, um, and we have to uh, respect where we're sitting too. And Quichi, the, the number of second homes here. Uh, is substantial and the number of second home actually permanent residents that are moving into Quichi is pretty amazing uh, and some of its anecdotal some of its factual um, and part of it's because of the amenities that the Quichi Club has actually invested in uh, it's really incredible um, so it's it is somewhat uh, about regulation but it's also about some creative ways there are many different housing organizations that have created perpetually affordable housing uh, and those programs do exist and they do actually help maintain the character of different neighborhoods by making housing permanently affordable so uh, champlain housing trust has done that twin pines housing trust has done that many different partners around the state have tried to figure out ways to actually keep uh, housing affordable for permanent residents so some of those creative solutions are really necessary uh, and maybe even building into that the commercial buildings which have second or third floors uh, that are currently vacant or not being used those could be converted into housing that could be kept perpetually affordable as well I know there's an effort there's a small group of people in Woodstock that are working to actually find those properties and convert them into the, that so there are some efforts but you're right it's it's always an issue uh, with short-term rentals and thank you so much <laughs> thank you again for having us so I'm going to turn it over to PJ here, but I want to comment about, I think minimum wage is probably important to a lot of business people out there. And I, the way I understand that, that has passed the Senate and now is in the House. And uh, It's in Randall's committee now. And probably looks like some form of, a, of an increase in the minimum wage will pass it, I think. Uh, the governor might try, veto, but I think it might be veto proof, I'm thinking. Uh, and uh, I think the current bill calls for $15 an hour um, in the next five years. Right. So, anyway, PJ, thank you very much for everybody for coming. Thank and, you. And to our thank you. Thank you for our lawmakers. Thank you for legislators. We want to give a shout out to our sponsors, uh, Two Rivers Autoquichi Regional Planning Commission, have been great sponsors of ours for the last uh, several years here with uh, Legislative Breakfast and also our Balloon Festival. So I need to give him a shout out so now I can hit him up for the balloon festival. <laughs> but I do, I do appreciate our legislators. Uh, for me, what I take away from this is obviously we need a, a hundred more meetings like this because we're, we've got a long way to go. And uh, to Jerry's point, I, I work in a chamber office like Beth does and we get calls daily looking for bodies. People need bodies to work. So, and I hear part of solutions. I really haven't heard many solutions here today. I'm not blaming anybody, but we as a, uh, an area, just the upper valley, we need to work on solutions. And to talk about getting, like, I have three kids, went to college, all live away, they're never going to come back here. They can't afford to live here. Not a hope in heck of them coming back here. I wouldn't even, even encourage them to come back here. I love Vermont. I sell it daily. It's beautiful. People love to come in here. But we've got to get our act together, especially affordable housing. So I'm glad to hear you guys spend some time on that. 
because there's solutions out there, but we got to throw outside the box solutions, and it's not all these folks' responsibilities to have our solutions either, right? So I, I see a lot of more meetings. I, I, I do know that Jim has got some work on its hands. Uh, I do thank you all for coming. Um, next time around, we're going to limit the questionnaires to like uh, 30 seconds, so at least they, they can answer something, because uh, some of our questions got kind of convoluted, but anyway. Uh, Appreciate you guys coming here, and uh, we'll, we'll carry on. Thank, oh, thank you to the Creechy Club as well. They appreciate the club that they put on a great uh, breakfast for us this morning, and they, they hosted the place, so we appreciate it. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day.